Good afternoon uh, to all of you who are in Mongolia and Korea and other parts of Asia and good morning to all of us who are here in Europe. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted actually to welcome everyone here today to attend ODI's online event on sustainable economic recovery in Mongolia, challenges and opportunities. My name is Suma Chakrabarti. I'm chairman of ODI's board of trustees and I'll be chairing today's event. I guess not just in my capacity as a chair of ODI's board, but as someone with a real interest in emerging markets and in this field. Uh, I've been working on emerging and developing countries for 40 plus years now. And as when I was president of the European Bank uh, for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, between 2012 and 2020, I engaged very closely with Mongolia. It was one of my favorite places to visit and to work with uh, mm -hmm. the Mongolian authorities. I visited the country at least three times, I think. In fact, it was one of the last countries I visited before lockdown uh, took over. So, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so I think one of the key lessons, I guess, from this rather long career is, is the importance of market-friendly policy reform, improving investment climates to spur economic recovery and, and uh, development indeed. So ladies and gentlemen, I think ODI is absolutely delighted to be hosting this important event. Indeed, I think uh, today's event comes at a rather critical time. Uh, Mongolia's mm. new recovery policy, which was launched in December 2021, well, it's more mm. than just a roadmap uh, to recover from the economic damage that was inflicted by uh, COVID-19. It's also a key part of the government's long-term strategy to become an industrialized state. So Mongolia's new e recovery policy, I think it aims to spur economic growth in a number of areas including energy, uh, border ports, industrialization, urban and rural recovery, green development, and importantly, public sector efficiency as well. I think it's very much part of the country's uh, longer term vision 2050, which aims to transform Mongolia into a leading Asian country in terms of its social development, its uh, economic growth, and its citizens' quality of life. Of course, 2050 is some way off, but the direction of these policies is going to really shape Mongolia's future. So they're very, very important to lock them in now and to think about them now. And if successful, these policies will strengthen the country's economy, ensure inclusive growth, and build the country's resilience in the long term. I think the, import, the emphasis on resilience is really rather important to consider. This event is, of course, taking place in the aftermath of protracted border lockdowns in COVID-19 China. Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, two incidents which have, of course, seriously affected economic growth in the region and have also, of course, affected Mongolia's economy too. Now, building resilience, I think, to future shocks has to be a cornerstone of Mongolia's economic recovery. So I'm really delighted that we have so many high-level speakers here with us today to discuss these uh, pressing is issues. Uh, I really hope this discussion can improve our understanding of Mongolia's economic priorities, its reforms, and it also clarify the opportunities and challenges that come with those uh, priorities and reforms. We're going to try and do this event in four parts. Um, the first uh, part will be to hear from our keynote speaker, uh, His Excellency the Deputy Prime Minister, about the vision behind Mongolia's economic plan. We'll then have a brief presentation from ODI, which puts the new uh, recovery policy into context and also introduces an upcoming report, which is going to be published at the end of this month. I'll then invite our distinguished panelists to discuss some of the key issues facing uh, Mongolia as it navigates uh, economic and environmentally sustainable recovery. And finally, if we have enough time, I really hope the panel discussion can be followed by a short Q&A uh, session with the audience. Uh, so I encourage everyone who's listening into this uh, to write your questions into the chat function. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our keynote speaker for today's event, His Excellency uh, Amasai Khan uh, Sayun Buyan, the Deputy Prime Minister of Mongolia. Uh, Mr. Amasai Hung was uh, appointed Deputy Prime Minister of Mongolia in 2021. But he has a number of other roles as well. He's a very busy man, it seems. He's head of the State Emergency Commission. He co-heads the Mongolia European Union Cooperation Committee, the Chamber of Commerce and Investment between Mongolia and the United States, and round tables with countries including Britain 
and Canada. So we're very lucky to have a, a little bit of his time today, given his uh, wide range of roles. Your right, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Your Excellency, let me ask you to take the floor. Well, first, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to the Overseas Development Institute and the chair of its board, Sir Suma Chakrabarti, for arranging today's online launch event and giving me a floor to talk about the new recovery policy pursued by the government of Mongolia. So like you mentioned, uh, this uh, launch event is being held in a rather critical time. And we, I certainly agree with you. So during the past three years of COVID-19 pandemic, like any other countries, I'm sorry, Mongolia made great uh, strides uh, in saving lives and the rescuing livelihoods of households. Financial institutions uh, as the, such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund and Agent Development Bank reported that Mongolia's uh, post-pandemic recovery is gaining a momentum. And we are quite uh, optimistic uh, and positive about that. A sharp upstick in our 2022 GDP reflects 4% growth, which we are expecting to continue in the upcoming uh, years. The launching of an underground uh, operation at the OU Tolgoy uh, copper mine is, um, you know, this month's. Uh, gives us a reason for such uh, good and high expectations too, uh, I could may, uh, mention. The Mongolian government uh, unveiled new, uh, the new recovery policy in December 2020. The initial 10-year phase of our long-term development policy is known as Vision 2050. So the new recovery policy represents uh, almost uh, 150 trillion or uh, 49 billion US dollars in investment opportunity and aims to create a vibrant economy surrounded by big markets like uh, our neighbors. So to accomplish this goal, Mongolia is actively improving its uh, social, uh, economic and social political system at the same time. In addition, we intend to expand our economic and commercial relationships with uh, nations in and beyond the region by forming a conducive investment and legal environment. So with the new recovery, uh, new recovery policy, we have highlighted uh, six areas in the Mongolian economy, including bottleneck set the border crossings. As a result, we're working to increase uh, our border ports capacity three times and total export capacity by 20 billion USD by 2030. So in the past three years, so we have built nearly 1,000 kilometers increase our export capacity two to threefold in the next uh, three years. So our energy infrastructure are mostly relying on coal, as you already know. So therefore, Mongolia is committed to shifting to low carbon solutions like solar, wind, and hydrogen. We plan to build two new hydroelectric dams by 2030. So by the 2030, we will provide 30 energy demand with tightening our energy resources and transmission distribution grids and networks. So also we aim to
I wonder if um, we've lost uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, or whether we can switch off the video and hear him without the video. Okay, I've got a message uh, from the technical side saying uh, it's not work connection is not working right now. Um, so I suggest uh, we need to adapt and hopefully we can reconnect with the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, so maybe a bit earlier than perhaps advertised, uh, uh, we move to the ODI uh, section of this event. I think I'll, we'll try and get the Deputy Prime Minister back in a minute if we can. Um, uh, Elvira and Elena, if you're ready, um, then we will probably have, need to do your presentation now and then try and come back to him. Um, so as many of you know, ODI is a global affairs think tank. It was uh, founded in, in 1960 and the research of ODI informs policy design. ODI also convenes leadership around the world on a number of international challenges. Uh, in particular, ODI's Global Risks and Resilience Program is very active and working to understand global and country tra transitions. And at the end of this month, um, ODI will be launching a report on Mongolia's economic transition, which provides an overview of the new recovery policy that the Deputy Prime Minister was uh, just talking about. That uh, report will analyze also the economic challenges facing Mongolia and highlights the case and opportunities for greening its growth. Uh, so let me now invite Elvira Mami and Elena Borodina we're both senior analysts in ODI's Global Risks and Resilience Program to briefly introduce this report and then help us situate the new recovery policy in context. Uh, Elvira and Elena, over to you. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we are going to provide some context for today's discussion and talk about Mongolia's economy, new recovery policy and our recommendations. I will start into, with looking into Mongolia's economic growth in the last decade. Mongolia's economy grew at a remarkable rate, um, averaging almost 8% in the last decade, growing um, growth ma mainly driven by the mining revenue. Due to the pandemic and the border closures with China, the economy contracted 4.6% in 2020. The war in Ukraine has affected Mongolia through distorted supply chains and elevated food and fuel prices, then the country imports wheat, fertilizers, uh, and energy from Russia. Depreciation of Tugrik has increased the price of imports, thereby affecting consumption. The extractive sector contributes 90% of exports of Mongolia and 24% of GDP. As can be seen from this graph, Mongolia GDP is highly correlated with coal and coal prices. Economic recovery in Mongolia, like in many export and import dependent countries, is vulnerable to external price shocks. Due to little domestic and international diversification, recovery depends on exports of raw materials to China. Moreover, high export costs and poor infrastructure links hinder trade. Top Mongolian exports are copper, coal, gold, animal hair, wool and cashmere, exporting mostly to China, China, Switzerland, Singapore and Korea. Mongolia was top exporter of raw and processed animal hair in the world in 2021. Mongolian top imports in 2021 are refined petroleum products, cars, machinery, and electricity, importing mostly from China, Russia, Japan, and Korea. It is expected that the launch of new railways, such as Zunbayan Hangi Railway in November last year and Tavan Talgoy Line in September last year, will boost trade in the upcoming year. The outlook for 2023 is positive. The GDP per capita at the end of last year was four and a half thousand dollars. Uh, GDP um, growth uh, projected for 2023 is up to 7%. China's economic recovery is likely to support Mongolian economic growth. Upcoming launch of the largest mining project in Mongolia's history promises to support the economy of the country. However, the inflation remains high and the fiscal space is limited. Given that the Mongol bank interest rate is already high at 13%, any further rises to suppress inflation may hinder small and medium enterprises. The launch of Oyutolgoi is likely to positively affect the mining revenue. 
And it is critical that given high import dependency of the consumption in Mongolia, that the country utilizes the mining revenues to increase the value added in the mining sector and develop non-mining sectors of the economy, and that the country avoids increasing imports and any further pressure on the exchange rate, the currency, and the consumption. Some of the measures that Mongolia should undertake for industrial growth include upgrading of the sectors of the economy, uh, uh, such as cashmere and leather, increasing FDI, in non-mining uh, sectors, uh, supporting a local suppliers to the mining sector, improving business environment to support uh, small and medium enterprises. Under the new recovery policy, Mongolia is already um, planning to increase the value added in the uh, traditional copper industry, for example, by investing into smelting and refining and producing finished copper products. Improving infrastructure links and reducing export costs will also help to boost trade and support local businesses. I will now hand over to my colleague Olena, who will talk about the new recovery policy and the green transition. Thank you, Elvira, and thank you to our distinguished guests and chair for joining the discussion today. Some of you may already be familiar with the government policy, policy to support sustainable recovery of the country. Mongolia has um, several policies to support medium and long term development. Um, which include the Vision 2050 that was adopted in 2020, but also the new recovery policy that was um, that aims to double the GDP by per capita by um, double by 2030. Um, the new recovery policy aligns with the first stage of Vision 2050 and goes up to 2030, and it aims to support the country's recovery and lay the groundwork for further growth um, by uh, by addressing six key economic constraints. These include trade trade ports, um, energy industrialization, urban and rural development, green development, and efficient government governance. Um, the reform package combines both key infrastructure initiatives and public-private partnerships, um, as well as partial privatization of enterprises. While the new recovery policy itself does not contain projects, the implementation plan of the new recovery policy accelerated does um, contain 94 key investment projects to, to date, that cover the key priority areas. These are heavily concentrated in port and energy revival with 43 and 21 projects respectively, and are followed by industrial revival with 15 projects, um, urban and rural development with seven projects, green growth with five projects, and public sector efficiency where there are seven projects. When it comes to green development, I think um, a number of people, um, we have already mentioned that green development is part of the government's medium and long-term vision, and even the earlier green development policy has emphasized the need to shift from grow first and clean it up later model to one that's more environmentally sustainable and inclusive. Um, why does the country need to pursue green development as part of its recovery policy? Well, the new recovery policy highlights several environmental and climate challenges that are facing the country as it pursues recovery. Um, these include um, above two degrees warming um, of in average temperatures in the last 80 years, high levels of desertification and land degradation, but also high share of total water, um, surface water as total water resources, which makes the country vulnerable um, to water stress. In terms of sectoral opportunities, um, Mongolia has huge untapped um, plant um, renewable energy potential that's assessed at 2.6 terawatts of both solar and um, wind power. And the country has already launched several projects in the last decade to, um, to, to capitalize on that potential with new solar projects to be added under the new recovery policy. Under the new recovery policies itself, under the green development pillar, the country has two flagship initiatives. There is the One Billion Trees National Initiative that aims to combat desertification and land degradation, but also the Blue Horse projects that will supply grown domestic and industrial water needs of the Gobi region where most of the mining is concentrated. And measures pursued under other pillars, such as adding new solar projects, um, will also support green recovery and growth. And there are also opportunities to support green development under other pillars, so, such as industrialization, by pursuing greening, um, green mining practices. And I will now hand over to Elvira to talk through some of the policy implications that we have identified in our emerging analysis. Thank you so much. Yeah, the government of Mongolia has come a long way in supporting the sustainable economic recovery of the country. 
Well, nevertheless, there is still scope to maximize the effectiveness uh, of these policies and to strengthen the resilience of the economy to economic shocks. To achieve its ambitious goals, Mongolia should undertake an effective mechanism of, for strategy monitoring and implementation. To facilitate the monitoring of the strategies, the implementation plan should con contain a list of strategic priorities, actions to achieve these priorities, a breakdown of long and short-term measures, and realistic key performance indicators. New recovery reform package efficiency will be maximized when it is supplemented by a transparent mechanism of investment project selection, access of SMEs to these projects, analysis of privatization of state-owned enterprises. Mongolia should continue to create a favorable investment climate for investors, uh, both domestic and foreign, and to improve the business environment by facilitating business opening processes and removing bureaucratic hurdles for businesses. Governments should continue implementing incentives to stimulate investment into higher value added sectors of the economy. Among other measures, such incentives may include supporting the local suppliers to the mining sector. The country should continue to ensure that international good practices for environmental and social risk management are followed and opportunities to improve companies' AG practices are maximized for all future investment projects across sectors. Mongolia should continue its efforts to strengthen institutional capacity. International experience shows that institutional quality is the only determining factor of success or failure of any policy. Uh, with its relatively small population, vast mineral resources, big neighboring markets, and upcoming launch of the largest mining project of its history, Mongolia can utilize its opportunities to strengthen its resilience to economic shocks of the future and to build a robust industrial economy. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, ODI, and thank you, uh, Elvira and Elena. I think that helped us understand the landscape in which the new uh, recovery policy has been launched uh, and also some of the key i guess considerations for which will be important in implementation particularly um let me try and get back now to the deputy prime minister i think we've re-established the connection um uh, deputy prime minister uh, you were going strong and and we lost the connection i think when you were telling us about oh yeah we lost the connection during my yeah, story. You were telling us about the energy sector so uh, i think from that point onwards we we lost you so maybe we can come back to you and your uh, keynote speech and you can continue from there if you'd like to well thank you for that i'm sorry about this connection yeah yeah i was uh, talking we were talking about this energy efficiency and renewable energy so we are working on to widening our uh, new energy resource transmission and distribution networks and grids. Also, while aiming to maintain our relations with our immediate two neighbors, we continue to seek to explore new markets with tourism and trade or agricultural based business, which is based on value added. Uh, like products and services, uh, goods and commodities, a natural resource. Uh, our government is taking several actions to, to attract uh, foreign direct investment by denationalizing state-owned companies and banks that need investment, skilled management, and marketing of their products uh, need to be promoted. One of them is that our government uh, launched five-point campaign to fight corruption. We would like to see our current corruption index uh, become two digits through a comprehensive campaign of encouraging like whistleblowers, which has six components, mopping off and calling corrupted officials to justice and repatriation of fugitives and transparency in governance. Uh, efficient and sound governance uh, is our priority. And uh, by removing red tape, uh, corruption and abuse of power is vital for our government. So by fulfilling them, Mongolia will become more attractive destination for foreign direct investment. And uh, we will have more internationally accepted standard and legal and business environments. That's what we are expecting. 
So establishing a foreign direct investment agency and cooperating with investors on how Mongolia's trade, economic, and investment ties can be improved and expanded is very important for us. And also how sparsely populated vast territory could be turned into an attraction for investment by promoting the comparative advantage of our regions and different uh, provinces. So for instance, uh, decreasing the budgetary investment is also very important and promoting the private sector in the economy leaving a regulatory role to the state. So, for example, the Southwest will become, the Southwest will become a center of wind energy and green development. There is huge natural potential there. The Southeast will focus on wildlife protection and also like a, a plantological hub. So, the North will become a manufacturing hub with suburbs of Ulaanbaatar city uh, will be turned into modern business parks with improved public transport system and decentralize the current uh, population of the capital city uh, by implementing new public transportation systems, constructing bypassing highways and railways and also constructing two model cities. Uh, yeah, it is also underway. The parliament, the government have already approved the, the decision and uh, the master plans are on the way. And bypassing highways will be connecting your, your Asian markets like uh, China and Russian borders uh, will be connected. Uh, so we will have more access international routes to encourage our economy. So this will improve our, our also our urban development and will, uh, and will, will bring uh, uh, more wealth across our country and region. There is an inadequate industrial and trade infrastructure due to uh, a lack of investment and infrastructure opportunities in rural areas that will still need to pay needed to pay attention. So our billion tree initiative will replant 600,000 hectares of land and will prevent soil erosion and ensure improved carbon storage. We will upgrade the capacity of the current infrastructure, protect elevated and arid land and plant trees uh, against uh, uh, the land degradation and uh, caused by CT uh, and also desertification. Uh, to uh, reduce the climate change as well, and also commit and contribute ourselves. Last but not least, uh, it uh, is uh, disaster risk reduction. It is becoming more serious and more important, uh, including increasing public awareness and improving the early warning system at national, regional, and local levels, which could help avoid the loss of resources so we have that could be used for sustainable growth in the future. So there are many other issues so we could uh, emphasize and bring out, but we have time uh, limit. Uh, but uh, this uh, uh, Last thing is that digitalizing our government uh, service to the uh, people is so important uh, and it will uh, you know, help significantly to reduce corruption, bureaucracy and red tape to, uh, to, to you know, have transparent and more efficient governance in Mongolia. So that's what our government is aiming. And these are the main issues our government is focusing within the uh, new recovery policy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. I'm, I'm so glad thank we established the connection because that was a very rich presentation, I think, uh, of the challenges, the opportunities, and also the commitment to drive mm -hmm. policy reform. And uh, I mean, I, you know, I've always, um, 
been a great admirer, frankly, of Mongolia uh, in terms of both the political and the economic path that it's chosen and the way it's gone forward on that. I mean, uh, I think what you said about re renewable energy um, is really, really important. I, I remember my first visit to Mongolia, um, EBRD had just invested in the first wind farm in Salkit, uh, just outside yeah. of Ulaanbaatar. It was a wonderful um, visit and I went to the wind project and everything was going fine. The EBRD had forgotten one thing, which is they didn't arrange any wind that day. So uh, unfortunately, the blades weren't moving, but it was a great project. And, and I think what you're oh, hearing, yeah. your emphasis on renewable energy is wonderful. The emphasis on the bottlenecks um, at the borders, trying to fight that as well, sustainable infrastructure. And very interesting what you said about the regional comparative advantage, different regions specializing in different, uh, you know, um, different industries and so mm -hmm. on. That's really important. I must mm -hmm. say also what you said about fighting corruption, uh, very, very welcome and really, really important. Um, and I think mm. one other point you didn't mention, but I'd like to mention, um, which is, I think, yeah, please, yeah. which is, I think Mongolia is a real model of a country that's, uh, you know, post-communist, uh, post-economic mm. planning. It's really gone for both political democracy as well as economic democracy. And if you look at the latest Freedom House numbers, it's quite interesting how Mongolia outranks any other country in the region by a long distance. I mean, it's a huge gap. Mm. Uh, and I yes. admire the fact that you've tried to do both and not just one, one of those two uh, major things. And I think it's uh, a real role model to emerging markets in many ways. So um, we're going to move now into the sort of panel discussion. And uh, Deputy Prime Minister, I'd like to start with you with just a, one question, which is mm. about really, could you say a little bit more about how Mongolia is going to support industrialization, industrial development, particularly industrial development? What are, the, what are the things you'd highlight that Mongolia will be doing in that area? Well, thank you. Uh, like you mentioned, Mongolia is a truly vibrant and functional democracy in the region. And we are proud of that. And also we are very uh, satisfied with uh, what you have said. Uh, and also thank you for your support and uh, strong cooperation in uh, improving human rights and also uh, the uh, respect of law, law and also the other common values of democracy around the globe. So let me get back to this, uh, your question. Uh, just I'll try to answer briefly. So uh, the government of Mongolia announced the new recovery policy in 2021 which uh, is a roadmap to industrialize Mongolia to uh, Mongolia and, and also achieve uh, higher growth in, in both the uh, uh, economy and other social economic sectors. So it will focus on many different areas that uh, Mongolia will uh, continue to develop in. So for instance, uh, this uh, uh, New recovery policy, we have identified six areas uh, uh, you can uh, uh, find in our Vision 20, uh, like new energy resource uh, transmission and distribution, like I mentioned earlier, networks will be established, as well as having the capacity enhanced and upgrade the current and existing aged infrastructure, while core production forms a core part of this uh, uh, Mongolia is also committed to transitioning to a low carbon solution like uh, uh, solar and wind and, 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 and hydrogen power and including wind development, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the government of Mongolia is uh, you know, aiming to attract more foreign investment uh, to invest in infrastructure sector of Mongolia based on uh, public-private partnership. And we are also working to establish uh, uh, international financial center in Mongolia so that the foreign investors, uh, whether it's uh, foreign or local investors, they could all enjoy international uh, services of business like banking, insurance, or legal or financial services uh, at the same level where you could uh, find the services anywhere in the world, like in 
London or Singapore or whatever, where, wherever it is. So the government's aim is very ambitious, um, and we will, we're you know looking into increase our border capacity threefold, increasing total export by twenty billion by uh, twenty thirty, which is in the next coming five six years. So with also with advanced uh, technologies, uh, our industries will be modernized and digitized, thereby increasing the volume of value-added goods for both domestic use and, and, and also foreign export. Because basically now we are almost uh, import dependent, starting from oil, uh, fuel, or other um, products and services, so almost uh, more than 50% uh, of whether it's uh, uh, building materials or uh, grocery uh, items, but we aim to be a producer, initiated by the president of Mongolia and, uh, and also driven by the prime minister of Mongolia and our cabinet. Uh, we are determined to use all, all our internal resources to, and have the private sectors and the citizens involved in the the development of production and processing sectors. So that's how we will promote them and support them with in terms of legal, uh, you know, environment uh, improvement, maybe tax policy or um, have better infrastructure and give them some uh, promotion of uh, uh, some tax, uh, you know, other in incentives. So that's what uh, we are looking at to improve the industrial. Uh, sector and also industrialized the country. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's a, again, very clear explanation of the policy around industrial development. Very, very useful. And um, I commend uh, I, uh, in particular what you said about trying to create an international financial center. Uh, I think that will be very helpful. I mean, I'm involved with the Astana International Financial Center, and that's been one of the successes, I think, in Kazakhstan. I would particularly recommend uh, trying to create a, the legal jurisdiction around the International Financial Center because that has been probably the most successful part of the Kazakh experience actually uh, in attracting mm -hmm. investors and bringing English common law, which is what most uh, investors are looking for in terms of settling disputes. So I'd be exactly. very happy myself to talk to you about that at some point. As yes, well. I look forward to having more detailed discussion with you later uh, very happy to on you, yeah, like you said. Uh, this uh, financial center with the uh, institutional uh, or legal jurisdiction uh, with the English common law. That's what we are aiming at. Thank you. Yeah. Very good, indeed. Well, let me turn now to my former colleague, uh, Zhuzhana Hagitai. Um, Zhuzha, I think you have to leave uh, in about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to try and ask you both questions. Zhuzha is the managing director for Central Asia and Mongolia at the EBRD. Uh, and of course, we know, Judah, that foreign investment is absolutely critical part of the new recovery policy. Huge potential role for the EBID coming up, I can see, both in terms of investments and policy work uh, in the country in supporting the transition. Uh, from your knowledge and experience of the economy of Mongolia, you were there very recently, I know. What are the sort of key challenges in the country's economic recovery? That would be question one. I think the second question, if you have time, you can just focus, say a bit about that. You've done a lot of work around SMEs in Mongolia. Um, how have SMEs fared through the double shocks of COVID and the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict? Um, and how, what is EBRD doing to try and help those SMEs get through this, um, this situation? Over to you. Thank you very much, Suma. <clears throat> Good to see you. But actually, I think that you were at one of my meetings last week because what we were discussing uh, with our government counterparts was the investment law. Uh, and we are going to review that draft and setting up an international court. So at least in spirits, we were there where we were, when was it now, seven or eight years ago in Kazakhstan. Um, and we have an understanding, but then dear Deputy Prime Minister, this would probably need to be reflected also in the new constitution so that there will be an offshore island for international jurisdiction. But uh, this is uh, one of the policy measures that the government of Mongolia is contemplating. And 
will be there to review the new investment law. And we would be delighted to help uh, with setting up an international court in Mongolia to start with, because whether we are talking about foreign investment or small and medium sized enterprises, this has been considered as one of the impediments. The courts are slow, not really reliable. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, you are aware that we are setting up an out of court dispute settlement system in Mongolia. And again, this is one of the, I noted down for myself, five impediments that both foreign investors and SMEs vote. Um, going into the still foreign direct investment sector, it is indeed the pride of EBRD having financed three out of the three wind farms in Mongolia. Uh, however, Deputy Prime Minister, there are issues, there are legacy issues. These were the early enters and uh, for all those of you who love the terminology of renewable energies, the feed-in tariffs, they are abominably high. They are abominably high now in 2022, 2023, because what we do nowadays is that number one, technology costs have gone down. Uh, competition also brought in new investments. So I would like to use this opportunity also to argue for resolving the outstanding issues because it's important only for two of your strategic priorities. Number one is to bring foreign direct investment into the country, and there is no better messenger than a happy foreign investor. Uh, and this is something that I think, with a bit of goodwill, can be resolved in weeks. We are talking about now issues that have been outstanding for years. And you, together with Rio Tinto, were able to solve the outstanding issues of Oyu Tolgoy. I was very delighted to be in Mongolia when the underground mine went into operation. And I believe that there is a trustworthy, good relationship between the government of Mongolia and Rio Tinto, and that will result in a lot of goodwill in the country. Um, SMEs, uh, EBRD invests in Mongolia. I leave aside Oyu Tolgoy, which is a mega project, between 100 up to $200 million per annum. The good news is that half of it goes to support SMEs. These are credit lines. You've got a good solid banking system. We have excellent partner banks, it Han Bank, it has bank, microfinance institutions. Still, access to finance remains an issue simply because of the higher collateral requirements. So I, we started a discussion about potentially establishing a credit guarantee fund for SMEs, whereby, again, for good SMEs, the government could step in, lowering basically the cost of financing, while again, this would be available to the best of these SMEs. But Suma SMEs, uh, we have seen galore. The Deputy Prime Minister mentioned suppliers. Suppliers to Oyu Tolgoy, they are hundreds of SMEs that live on that. Uh, they get timely payment. We can provide them also with guarantees. So suppliers to large companies, there are a lot of them. Uh, a lot of agribusiness, uh, Suma, since you work there in uh, Mongolia has grown. They have grown into production, including using the latest technology. I don't know which type of hyponic growing that was going there, but a lot of our clients, they go big time into using new technology, whether for animal husbandry and meat processing or in vegetables uh, production, and they are growing. They deserve also support as much as uh, we have a lot of our clients that are, that are going into construction, material manufacturing, and packaging material manufacturing. And last but not least, let me mention two other areas. Uh, I have met a lot of Mongolian companies in the ICT sector. Uh, they are brilliant. I hope that your plan to establish the new Ulaanbaatar city next to the airport that would also house ICT companies will materialize soon. They deserve all the support they have in parallel with a growing entertainment industry. Mongolia is becoming a host of stu film studios, uh, music studios. It's close enough, yes, to Korea, and you have now an agreement on cooperation in this industry that could give it another boost. And last but not least, Kashmir and leather. Uh, we very much welcome, also as part of anti-corruption measures, establishing a commodities exchange in Ulaanbaatar for coal to be followed, I hope, very soon for copper concentrate and also Kashmir and leather that could show the ways. 
And last but not least, uh, the issues. I mentioned already access to finance. Number two, where we hope to do more also with the government of Mongolia is skills for jobs. So that the education system uh, provides curricula and trainers that make young people job ready. A lot of, uh, especially SMEs have complained about not having enough of highly skilled uh, you young entering their business. Uh, dispute settlement I mentioned already. The development of uh, logistics is key to them because they are using for the time being more import products rather than export, but many of them have started exporting. So what the government is doing with the dry port development is crucial. Also the development of the railway network where you are hamstrung with a historic legacy, but I have seen private companies developing their own railways. And last but not least, developing secondary cities, public services. Uh, I finally managed, because we were financing it, uh, to get on the road to Darhan. Uh, and uh, we met with the governor of the, of the province. A lot has been done already, but public services, starting with hospital up to education, and then also, again, keeping the young people there and away from Ulaanbaatar traffic jam uh, would be important, whether it's Darhan, whether it's Erdenet. These are my couple of words, uh, including impressions from my last visit, which now was the fifth visit to Mongolia. And we have a fat investment pipeline that is still dominated by the private sector. Again, I would like to reiterate what colleagues from ODI said. We can call it decarbonization, green transition strategy. And I know Mongolia is a vigorous democracy, especially in the region that I work now, and you need to look at the elections, but the work on the strategy should start now. This is my last plea. Because again, over governments, yes, the strategy will be adjusted, but starting with a low carbon pathway for the energy sector would be highly important. And we would be very happy at EBRD to help you with that. So that what you describe, starting with resolving current issues with renewables going into harnessing the immense potential of Mongolia for renewable energy generation, including for Oyutolgoi. You could stop in the coming two to three years importing electricity from China, if only probably for balancing. That can be done and we would be there for you. So the strategy work would start now with the first tenders for renewable energy starting in the second half of this year. Thank you very much, Suma. Well, thank you, Zhuja. It's uh, fantastic um, to, to hear that uh, sort of, you know, uh, whole range of uh, policies and investment opportunities. I mean, I can see that if the investment climate and policy climate keeps improving, the levels of investment EBRD and others will be able to do will go up quite clearly. There's a lot to be done. And I think that's very welcome. Um, I, I loved what you said about um, the entertainment industry as well. That's a new one for me. It's uh, really good to hear about that. I can see the day will come when M-pop rivals K-pop, and uh, you know we can we look forward to that as well. I think uh, EBRD uh, Deputy Prime Minister has great strengths, particularly in green transition. So the low carbon uh, pathway, I think, is something that EBRD really should be closely involved in. If I can recommend that with the Mongolian uh, authorities, ODI is also happens to be very strong in that area as well. So maybe there's an opportunity for a partnership, a tripartite partnership, uh, on that as well. Zhuja, you better go and catch your plane in Budapest Airport. Uh, so we'll let you go. Thanks very much indeed. Let me turn now uh, to um, introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Bolor, Bolorma uh, Engbat. Uh, now, Ms. Engbat is uh, an, a governor, actually. Zhuja mentioned the governor of Dahan, but uh, Bolorma is the governor of Hovd province in uh, Western Mongolia. Great to have you here with us today. Uh, it really is very good indeed. But prior to becoming governor, she served as chief of staff to the prime minister, during which time she actually led the working group, which helped develop the new recovery policy. So she was right in the in the engine room, if you like, uh, driving that work. Uh, governor Enkbat, we've heard a lot about the new recovery policy from a national perspective. I think we're actually quite curious to hear from you about what it looks like at a regional level. At a, you know, how will this policy get implemented at regional level. Uh, the, His Excellency mentioned regional comparative advantage. Uh, so what's the key importance of this policy to your province and what will, it, what will it look like on the ground? Over to you. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you to ODI for organizing 
um, today's panel discussion. Um, now that I'm based in Hoft province, and just to give a brief overview, Mongolia has 21 provinces and Hoft is based in the Western region, as you mentioned, and is center of the Western five provinces. Um, one of the six pillars of the new recovery policy is balanced urban and rural growth. And this is one that is fully aligned with uh, provincial growth, uh, but all other recovery and all other pillars are absolutely um, uh, critical to uh, growth in the provincial areas. So uh, particularly, I just want to mention one statistics, which might really give an overview of the condition of Mongolia in terms of its density in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, for anyone who's been to Ulaanbaatar, it's a rather urban metropolitan city and 50% of the population lives in Ulaanbaatar, which is just 0.3% of uh, all land mass. So half of the population is concentrated in less than 1% of the, the land. And 65% of GDP is uh, produced in Ulaanbaatar. So we, um, the government's really focused on spreading this growth and in, into rural areas. And um, for the Western region, as the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, you know, regional comparative advantages in ours is really around connectivity and our um, proximity to, say, Kazakhstan, the western area of China, Xinjiang Uyghur region, as well as Russia. Um, and we have an uh, international highway through the um, Hof province, as well as buying of the province that's already started transit of um, Russia-China transit uh, transportation. Um, so these are just examples of how we're a big part of the new recovery policy. Now, there are key projects that are um, specifically in the provincial levels and outside of Ulaanbaatar. Um, for example, as we're talking about Rio Tinto and Ayutalga project, the copper mine, this is in our southern uh, area of Umunlo province, and it's making a big impact on the local area. And a lot of these SMEs that we're uh, discussing and suppliers, um, they're based in the rural areas. Uh, similarly, in the western region and specifically Specifically in Hof province, we have uh, one of the larger uh, renewable energy projects in the pipeline, which is the Erdenbuden Hydro uh, plant. That's a bilateral project that's um, uh, being implemented with the government of China. So this is a 90 megawatt uh, renewable energy hydropower project, which is the largest that the gov that the country's ever built. Um, you know, the Setkik project that we're discussing is 50 megawatts. So 90 would be our largest renewable energy. And this, you know, becomes the stepping stone to our next Igingos uh, hydropower plant, which is 315 megawatts. And, you know, these projects together will increase Mongolia's energy capacity twofold, um, and which really builds the idea of sustainable growth um, that we're talking about, a resilient growth um, that's a key part of all of uh, new recovery policy. Now, another thing I wanna um, highlight, which is key importance of this policy to Hoft, as well as all other uh, rural provinces, is the digital digitalization aspect and um, public sector productivity. Um, so Mongolia is the least densely populated country in the world, as we all know. So in order to increase public sector productivity, we've, the government's really given a lot of focus on digital, digitalization and, um, you know, getting uh, government services to rural areas through um, applications and all sorts of different models. And um, this is kind of giving everyone a sense of, yes, we can live in rural areas, um, and you know, be a part of this growth, be a part of this shared growth, um, and still receive government services. So I do want to um, highlight that the sixth pillar, is, which is public sector productivity, is a key part of um, kind of balanced growth and making sure that wherever you are in Mongolia, whether it be in urban or rural areas, you're getting the same type of uh, government service with the same um, level of productivity. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Governor. I think that's, that was very interesting, actually, both from the regional aspects in terms of the comparative advantage, also the particular location of the province in terms of trade routes and so on and uh, with neighbours. But I also really was uh, interested in what you said about public sector productivity as well, that a lot of these reforms to which will, of course, encourage the private sector growth and private sector development in uh, Mongolia 
cannot really happen unless the public sector also becomes much more effective and efficient. And I think the digital agenda is very important as part of that. So thank you for highlighting that too. Let me uh, turn now to uh, Mandul uh, Nion Man Delek. Uh, he is the CEO of the Development Bank of Mongolia. He was appointed to that role in 2021. And he's in charge of implementing the bank's long-term uh, operational strategy and business plan. Uh, and before being elected to that role, he worked as a project consultant at the World Bank uh, and as Director General of the Department of the uh, Ministry of Finance as well. So good multilateral and uh, uh, government experience as well, very important as well. So um, we've heard uh, that economic diversification is a key part of Mongolia's economic recovery plan. What do you think is the role of the Development Bank in supporting that economic recovery of Mongolia? What are the challenges that you particularly think the Development Bank should be focusing on? Hi, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, just uh, let me just briefly explain what is uh, the Development Bank of Mongolia. Uh, this is the only policy bank of Mongolia with it, its own law, and uh, it has 100% uh, owned by the government with implicit guarantee. And the mandate is at least 60% of the loan portfolio has to be export oriented projects. And uh, so, all in all, the development bank itself is the uh, financing arm of the government, so you can say. And uh, the role of the bank is crucial to uh, new economic recovery policy. Uh, as you may know, the new economic recovery policy has about 90 key projects that the government has identified as uh, crucial to the development of the country. And at this moment, the bank is uh, financing three of these projects and we are looking into uh, financing more projects in the future starting this year the challenges of course is uh, i would say uh, two main parts first would be project preparation preparation takes uh, so much time in Mongolia. it's uh, due to the complicated procedure as well as an inexperience of government handling this large scale project. The second area I think is uh, would be the unfamiliarity of uh, foreign investors to Mongolian legal framework as well as the way of doing things so, for, so to say uh, the decision making procedure as well as the uh, all the different uh, regulations different uh, agencies of the government. Thank you. Thank you very much, actually, uh, Mandul. That was very interesting. Um, and I think uh, project preparation, you're right to highlight that. That's a problem in just about every emerging market. I mean, this is not unusual. In fact, I started my career 40 years ago working in Botswana on exactly this issue. And it's still a, a huge issue in many, many countries. I know that. And I know EBRD is usually not there. They've put quite a lot of uh, financing into infrastructure project preparation facility and so on. But these facilities haven't really quite taken off. And if we're to build a sustainable infrastructure in Mongolia that the Deputy Prime Minister talked about, clearly you've got to make much more of an effort on project preparation. I think with the multilateral development banks as well. So I think that's something we should definitely highlight uh, going forward and thank you also for mentioning the legal framework that's important too as well let me turn now to Danbold uh, Basanjayev uh, who is director of the east and northeast asia office for united nations economic and social commission for asia and the pacific or more simply known as unscap uh, great to have you here Danbold, as well um, prior to Joining UNSCAP, uh, uh, Ganbold worked uh, extensively for the government of Mongolia, uh, serving within the country in the foreign ministry, as well as abroad in a diplomatic uh, capacity. He was most recently actually the ambassador at large for sustainable development, I believe, at Mongolia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So very hugely experienced uh, 
uh, individual. And uh, UNSCAP is extremely important uh, in terms of Mongolia's development. So Ganbold, when we talk about environmentally sustainable economic growth in, in Mongolia, what do you think we mean by that? And why is transition towards low carbon growth it's so important for Mongolia, given it's such a resource-rich country. Over to you. Uh, thank you, David. And good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, good evening, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Amr uh, Thank you for uh, uh, to ODF for organizing this online event. It is indeed a uh, timely engagement on Mongolia's journey to sustainable economic recovery. As we further see the developments and implementation of Mongolia's new recovery policy after its launch in the end of 2021. In characterizing what environmental and sustainable economic growth means in Mongolia, allow me to filter it through the lens of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. And doing so, let me highlight key elements of Mongolia's United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Framework or UNSDCF to draw out not only the different dimensions of an environmentally sustainable economic growth, but also to put in perspective how Mongolia is progressing to achieve this envisaged kind of growth. For additional context, this framework embodies the Joint Strategic Planning Framework for collaboration between the United Nations and the government of Mongolia in the next five years until 2027, and is closely aligned with the national development agenda as articulated in Mongolia's Vision 2050. And environmentally sustainable economic growth seeks to balance development outcomes between shared prosperity and what is good for the planet set against Mongolia's circumstances in terms of shared prosperity, it is an economic growth that is more diversified across economic sectors, geographically balanced and innovative. In addition, it is an economic growth that creates not only productive employment, but also addresses inclusivity, creating more decent jobs and opportunities that enhance employability of marginalized groups. In relation to the planet in Mongolia, it is an economic growth that follows low carbon pathways and it's resource efficient where the socioeconomic benefits of resource use both on consumption and production patterns are maximized while minimizing the impacts. Also, it is an economic growth that strengthens resilience through addressing climate change and disaster risks. With such a description of what an environmental and sustainable economic growth means in Mongolia, undoubtedly we, we recognize the different development challenges and issues that need to be considered. While it is true that Mongolia was among the first countries to adopt the 2030 agenda, uh, with the parliament uh, of Mongolia approved, uh, approval of the country's long-term strategic sustainable development vision 2030 in February 2016, Mongolia's progress in achieving the SDGs has been quite challenging. According to the Sustainable Development Report uh, 2022, the overall SDG index for Mongolia is 63.5, ranked 119th out of 163 countries. And this is below the East and Southeast Asia regional average. Since 2015, the country has made progress on many SDGs, such as poverty reduction and quality education, while also moderately improving in gender equality, health, decent work, clean energy, and infrastructure. But it has also regressed uh, since uh, 2015 on responsible consumption and production and climate action two goals amongst the 17 goals, which are the most direct measures of how efficiently or inefficiently material resources are being used. It is in this context that Mongolia finds the strong impetus to transition towards low carbon growth. For one, such transition is important for Mongolia 
to urgently reverse the acute lapse in how it uses its resources. In addition, transitioning towards low carbon growth could unlock new growth drivers beyond resource dependent activities which would expand Mongolia's economic base as well as generate employment opportunities. And furthermore, by, by pursuing a low carbon growth trajectory, Mongolia rises to the challenges of being a key player to meaningfully contribute to addressing the global threat of climate change. Let me end by my intervention here. Thank you, David. Over to you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Gunbold. Um, that's quite an interesting uh, set of issues you raised. And I saw the Deputy Prime Minister was nodding in agreement with you about some of the challenges, particularly around SDG implementation, uh, and clearly the need to step up. And I think obviously the, the plan is, as I understand it, for the Mongolian authorities really to renew the emphasis on impl implementation to try and achieve the SDGs. Um, so, uh, but again, we can ask the Deputy Prime Minister in a few minutes to speak about that. Um, so just uh, before we, I'm going to throw a few questions to the panelists now, um, uh, but just before I do that, just to say that we do encourage those participants who are watching this to send any questions to the Q&A slot. I think we have one question maybe already, but uh, it'd be good to have a few questions from the panel uh, to the panel if we have time. We've got about 20 minutes left. Let me start um, with the next round of questions to our panelists. Uh, now, earlier this month, uh, Rio Tinto opened the first underground section, we heard about this, of the Oyu Tolgoi uh, mine in the South Gobi region of Mongolia. Uh, this mine is one of the largest uh, known copper and gold deposits in the world. Um, I actually went to the mine back in 2013 uh, and uh, it's good to hear about the underground section now being re being opened. Let me ask the Deputy Prime Minister, what does this mine actually mean for Mongolia's economic growth uh, and how does it fit into the new recovery policy? And Deputy Prime Minister, I know that this mine uh, was, shall we say, at the heart of many debates as part of Mongolia's democratic development. I remember the population uh, view about it, the revenue sharing issues that <laughs> that were uh, came up time and again. So in a way, um, it's been at the heart of the sort of democratic and economic development debate of, of uh, Mongolia. So tell us now what you how you see this mine really what it means for the economic growth of the future of the country. Deputy Prime Minister, you're on mute, I'm, I'm afraid, just uh, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. Well, you've been to the site and uh, you already know how huge, uh, huge this project is. So the, uh, all you told me, this uh, mine perfectly fits into Mongolia's new recovery policy. The government of Mongolia attached great importance to our its strategic partnership with the Rio Tinto. The recently resolved uh, long-standing issue between the two parties shows how the both sides are committed to this project. So we assume and see this uh, project uh, uh, to is a, a structure that forms a, an important structure and an important example that forms a core part of transforming mod, uh, and, and modernizing and expanding our industries. And this could be a great example for many other similar projects and different uh, projects in different sectors. It is the largest third neighbor for direct investment project and has one of the biggest resource for our economic uh, sustainable growth of uh, our economy. And Oyu Tolgo continues uh, uh, to boost the state budget and, and, and by ensuring that the government can reinvest this for the betterment of the Mongolian citizens, especially 
focusing on to build the uh, middle class. Uh, this is a very important uh, contribution and very significant uh, commitment uh, by the joint uh, cooperation. So currently, all youth workers workforce is, uh, consists of almost 97% uh, consists of Mongolian. And there are almost 20,000 workers. Uh, all of them are skilled and fits into their job requirement. Uh, and one-fifth uh, is female, uh, which matches perfectly to the government's uh, drive for more gender equality across the uh, nation and <clears throat> across the industry. And there, like uh, Ms. Hargit uh, mentioned, there's a lot of important, uh, raised out important issues and, and questions, especially supporting and encouraging SMEs. Currently, there are over 500 uh, uh, suppliers and SMEs supplying products and services and, and things like that. So back in 2022, Oyutogo produced close to 130 tons, 1,000 tons of copper concentrate and 183,000 ounces of gold in concentrate. And uh, by the 2030, Oyutolga is expected to become the fourth largest uh, copper producer in the world, producing almost uh, half a million tons of uh, copper per year. So, and then uh, in addition, uh, Rio's uh, purchase, so, is uh, uh, Turkish hill, uh, and also means that the project is moving forward with uh, simpler and more efficient uh, ownership and governance. And our prime minister uh, recently attended the the opening ceremony of the undercutting and undermining, which will be you know operating smoothly as we expect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. I, I can still remember the day uh, at the EBRD board, I think it was back in late 2012, early 2013, when we approved the investment in OU mm -hmm. And At that time, the biggest ever investment EBRD had ever made. Uh, and I'm really heartened to hear what you say about resolving the issues with Rio Tinto and now finding a joint way ahead. I think what you said about the emphasis on inclusion and the fact that it has quite a high percentage of female uh, in the workforce. Again, Mongolia in the region stands out for its commitment, but it's also its willingness to do something about inclusion compared with many of the neighboring states. I think that's really, really good to know. Uh, and you're absolutely right. You and Zhuja Hagitai both mentioned that actually the subcontractors and the contractors that are linked to this mine so the mine has lots of backward and forward linkages, basically, which really is quite important for the economy. So it, it is a very important, um, important, uh, you know, mine for the economic growth of Mongolia. I think we get that. Let me turn to uh, Ganbold uh, Basanjav again. You mentioned, uh, you know, that Mongolia needs to make this transition to a greener, more climate resilient economy. I think we all agree with that. Uh, how to accelerate that progress, Ganbold? What would you suggest should be the focus? Yes, I uh, uh, just to uh, try to characterize the different dimensions of in environmental sustainable economic growth. And these are the entry points which Mongolia could tap into to accelerate the transition to a greener and more climate resilient economy. And I believe there is due recognition in Mongolia on the policy areas to focus on as exemplified in the articulation of the, these priority areas in the new revival policy, which include energy, border ports, industrialization, urban and rural rec recovery, green development and public sector deficiency. With the clarity on the policy areas where to make policy interventions, Perhaps of importance is to also focus on the enabling factors and supporting processes and mechanisms to ensure that these policy interventions generate concrete results and impactful outcomes. To this end, allow me to highlight 
three points. First, the need to stronger and continuous cross-sectorial and multi-stakeholder coordination. The challenges of our times underscore that issues are more cross-cutting and seldom under the purview of one policy area. As an illustration, we just have to recall the challenges and disruptions we faced during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when, for instance, Disruption, disruptions on supply chains needed coordinated policy responses from customs, transport, health, to name a few. While the sectorial focus is clearly defined, on the ground implementation of policy interventions require a more concerted efforts across sectors. And this is something which needs to be strengthened and sustained to avoid unwanted externalities. In this regard, utilizing intersectorial, intraministerial coordination mechanisms could help in facilitating stronger coordination within the government. Second, the policy cha uh, challenges are indeed multifaceted and multi-level, and governments are, uh, are facing these challenges armed with limited resources. So there is a need to prioritize or draw up a coherent sequencing of policy interventions. Surely this is not a straightforward task and the government could not do everything at, uh, all at once. And this is where partnerships become key, including through public pu private partnerships. Third, in accelerating the transition to a greener and more climate resilient economy, both efficiency and equity considerations should uh, influence how policies are steered. Again, seeing through the lens of sustainable development, leaving no one behind is a key guiding principle of the 2030 agenda, reducing the inequalities and vulnerabilities that undermine the potential of individuals should be at the core of chosen pathways of economic transition. So let me end my intervention here, David, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ganbol. That's uh, very helpful. And again, this theme is coming through in many of these present uh, comments that people are making, the panelists, that we have a really good strategy. What we really need to focus on is implementation. That implementation is, you know, this is a common issue uh, in, from everything you, people have said. So that's a good takeaway for all of us. Talking about foreign investment, if I can ask uh, Mr. Niam Delek, uh, what should investors, why should investors be interested in Mongolia? What makes Mongolia special? Because investors have choices. They don't necessarily have to go to Mongolia. Why should they choose Mongolia? Uh, and what are the opportunities you see in the new recovery policy to excite foreign investors to come to Mongolia? Thank you. Um, so as the policy bank of Mongolia, the development bank, we constantly have conversation with foreign investors and uh, monitor the international market. And uh, the feedback that we hear a lot for the last few years is uh, investors usually complain about policy uncertainty in Mongolia. And uh, they talk about uh, a policy sudden change once after the election and uh, the conversation stops and we have to start again anew on all the major uh, policy parts. So from my perspective, the crucial point of the new recovery policy is uh, that it raises this policy uncertainty. So in, in other words, it uh, identifies the main areas for the development and identifies uh, 90 projects that the government sees as priority to implement first. And uh, the bank has uh, did a preliminary analysis on all the projects. About half of them is, has a social element. The other half has uh, could have some financial feasibility potential. 
and uh, some of the projects has uh, have a very high IRR internal rate of return, uh, even reaching 50, 60 percent. But usually it starts from 15 percent to 20, 30 percent. So as the frontier market with the economic growth of bonds, we think that uh, the new recovery policy projects have a unique uh, rate of return for uh, for investors, and that's what we try to communicate to the to the investors. Well, I think I think that uh, you know, I if I was a foreign investor and I heard what you just said about the IR, potential IRRs, I'd be getting on the first plane to Ulaanbaatar tomorrow, uh, or even not today. <laughs> that's okay. fantastic opportunities. Uh, we, clearly, advertising, marketing. All of that is going to be really important. The road shows to foreign investors really important. So a lot of lot of good stuff there. Um, let me uh, now take um, one last question to um, Ms. Enkvat. Uh, what do you think is a key challenge for sustainable recovery in your region? If you were to pick one thing in your region, in Hof province, what would you say is the, the thing to focus on for recovery? Mm -hmm. Um, I think we've heard about sustainable recovery from, from kind of the climate and environmental angle of it, um, but the kind of intention behind the new recovery policy aimed at Minister alluded to in terms of discussing the oil project. So I think really when you talk about you know, what sustainable development and recovery is, it's in really shared prosperity, shared growth. And especially in the rural areas, I think the biggest challenge to that is, you know, while there is growth um, in GDP and in, you know, nominal numbers, making sure that the middle class really takes part of that growth. That's, I think, probably the biggest challenge that we're seeing. And, and it's not growth just in urban areas, but it's increased growth for all. Um, and that's really going to be the basis for sustainable recovery, even from an environmental and climate perspective, because, you know, just a basic example, if one doesn't have income or a job, they're, they're going to easily get into, say, logging. So, you know, all environmental projects now go together with livelihood projects and really increasing prosperity and shared growth um, from even a climate and environmental perspective. So, from my perspective in the provinces and rural areas, I think the biggest challenge is making sure that this, the growth that we see from the new recovery policy is really shared growth. Um, uh, because it's not just nominal numbers being on the policy. So uh, I had um, economic growth of negative four point um, six in 2020, uh, but 2022, with one full year of new recovery policy implementation, we're seeing at a growth of 4.8%. So we're already seeing the fruits of the new recovery policy and it bearing its, you know, kind of results and implementation is going. Um, however, we want to make sure that this is shared growth um, in the rural areas. So that's probably the biggest challenge from my perspective. I think that's a really, really important point you make as well, because many emerging markets um, development has been to some extent arrested at a second and third stage because of widening disparities between who gets the fruits of the development. So I think you're absolutely right to emphasize the need for shared prosperity, making sure that you know all boats are floated, not just a few. Um, so that's really important, I think, for the strategy ahead. We've got just five minutes left. I'm going to um, put two two questions, um, I think, um, in one go to the Deputy Prime Minister. One of the questions in the, in the chat we have is about uh, agriculture. You know, what, uh, what should the country be trying to do uh, in terms of exporting high quality animal products that's one question i'd like you just to think about and say something about and the second one is a more on the financial side what are the plans for a for a sovereign wealth fund uh, and uh, how to take that forward in mongolia as well 
And then I'll come back to all the panelists for a quick fire last question each. DPM, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, what we need to do to support uh, and develop our uh, agricultural sector is to first adopt new and advanced technologies and improve our works, uh, uh, improve uh, work skill of the uh, people and experts in this sector and support them with uh, soft uh, financing and flexible funding. So those are the three things uh, uh, to support them efficiently. Uh, that's the key uh, three issues. And of course, there are many other uh, things need to be solved, uh, including ha having better legal and investment environment. But we do have very strong platform here and all the resource here uh, with vast territory and, and natural resource, uh, including this, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, fertilizers or fodder or hay, or, uh, you know, everything can be grown here, including uh, the vegetables for export. Uh, number two, uh, the uh, question was, uh, uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund question. Yes, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, we have this, uh, our government actually been working on the draft law for last uh, for the last two and a half years, since its establishment uh, back in 21. And we have our draft of uh, new law of uh, foreign uh, sovereign funds are ready in our hand. And we have everything, uh, uh, set to be submitted to the uh, the parliament, and we'll, hopefully we will have it uh, reviewed by the parliament uh, during the spring session and and approved. And uh, at the same time, we are working to in, uh, in, improve the efficiency of the state-owned uh, uh, corporations and mining companies like Erdnes Mongol or ETT or OT. Mongolia. So those are being settled at the same time to have right structure on, on one side and have the, the better legal environment on the other side. And combining these two, we will be able to realize our ambition and goal to uh, implement or set up the uh, national uh, sovereign fund. Well, that's a, that's a very good plan and look forward to the development of that uh, to see the National Wealth Fund being created. Now, um, panelists, we have precisely two minutes left and I'd uh, like you all to be extremely brief. Um, and I'm going to ask all of you, uh, I'll come to the Deputy Prime Minister last. I'll start with Mandul, then Bulorma, and then Ganbold, and then I'm going to ask uh, Olena and Elvira as well, and then the Deputy Prime Minister. What's your top hope? for 2023 in Mongolia, for this year, what's the th most important thing you can think Mongolia should be doing? Mandu. I think uh, on the back of the strong economic rebound and successful exit from COVID, I think uh, 2023 would be the turning point for Mongolia in terms of economic development. And uh, I would say that we are back in business Great, good answer. Thank you, Bolorba. Great, I think 23 is gonna be continued recovery. New recovery policy is gonna be second year in implementation. Um, EBRD's forecast is uh, economic growth of about 7%. Um, and EBRD was actually most on the point on for last year's growth. So um, I'm gonna trust those numbers for 23. Um, um, the, the government's continued work against corruption in class is going to be a key part of the new recovery as well for 23. Great. Thanks, Bulorma. 
Gambold. Yeah, absolutely. The, the year 2023 is yet another uh, year of opportunities for Mongolia. For uh, more importantly, together with the rest of the world, uh, the year marks the midpoint of the journey to achieving the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. And Mongolia is marking this milestone year by undergoing its second voluntary national review, having done the first in 2019. With this review, Mongolia is presented with the opportunity to assess its experiences, including successes, challenges, and lessons learned, and seek ways to strengthen policies in institutions or governments, and to, and to mobilize multi-stakeholder support and partnerships for the implementation of sustainable development goals. From our side at the United Nations, we have always reiterated our readiness as Mongolia's trusted partner in achieving the SDGs. Thank you, Suri. Thank you very much, Gamble. Well, Elvira and Olena, what's your what's you hoping for in 2023 for Mongolia? Thank you so much. Given the launch of Oyutal Gold Mine in Mongolia, um, I really hope that Mongolia utilizes this opportunity to strengthen its resilience, to increase self-sufficiency, and to reduce imports. Also, it is very important that Mongolia supports its population against inflation, and the consumption is um, also very um, uh, resilient in the country. Thanks very much. Uh, Olena? Oh, th thank you, Suma. Um, I think from my side, I, I really hope that there is a big push forward on the renewable energy. It's a priority for, for the government, it's a priority for the development banks, both EBRD, ADB, but also others working in the country, and it will also help to support Mongolia's industrialization and other objectives, um, as well as its climate ambitions. Okay. Thanks, Elena and Elvira. Thank you very much. And so, Deputy Prime Minister, what, what do you hope for in 2023? You've got so well, much on your plate. <laughs> well, the strong uh, effort and uh, commitment uh, of our government uh, have ensured that 2022 uh, our GDP group uh, grew by 4% uh, when many analysts uh, forecasted the growth of just over 2%. But uh, the GDP growth in the first quarter of 2023 was 10.2%, which put us back on track. And we really hope that this will continue. And uh, we really hope that uh, our economic growth will bring uh, better living standards for our uh, for our people in 2023 and uh, we will continue to work and fight day and night for stronger and more stronger economic growth through by implementing the new recovery policies uh, so that our future prospect, uh, prosperity is uh, shared by all the people nationwide. So perhaps the most uh, uh, exciting prospect for Mongolia in 2023 lies within us uh, tourism, because we uh, have uh, announced that uh, the 2023 to 2025 will be the years to visit Mongolia, and we and to increase our tourists up to 1 million in this year. So there are many optimistic uh, forecasts and, and calls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I, I hope uh, we at ODI can be more than tourists. We will continue to engage with you, but we'll also enjoy the country as well when we come uh, to visit as well and to work there. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right to stress the centrality of economic growth. Um, that's absolutely uh, thank you for that so we've come to the end of today's event but let me just pull out three or four key points um, from the discussions we've heard today uh, first of all I think diversification and industrialization are key for Mongolia uh, to affect that sustainable economic recovery in, in the long term you know you have the R in NRP it may stand for recovery but another key word that we've been hearing throughout the uh, discussion today is resilience as well. And building resilience to future shocks, I think is of course at the core of Mongolia's NRP and Vision 2050. Um, and I'm heartened from what, what I heard today about the work that's underway to build a stronger and more diverse economy. Second, uh, we heard also how critical Mongolia's economic 
uh, recovery and growth, the measures to support its green development agenda. And we've heard very promising signs from all the speakers uh, about how that's going to uh, take place. And I'm really encouraged by that as well. And third, um, you know, I think we've been talking about Mongolia today, and I mentioned that I started my career in Botswana, and uh, some similar issues about, uh, you know, economies that are reliant on natural resources. Uh, what do you do in this situation? Uh, and particularly, those economies have been particularly badly affected by events in recent years. Uh, it's great to hear Mongolia is on the recovery path and actually is doing better than the forecasts, actually, which is good news. Uh, but I think the direction that Mongolia's economic recovery takes is going to have a wider impact on emerging markets, on other natural resource dominated economies in the region, but also beyond the region, actually. Uh, and because they all need to adapt. And I think it's always been interesting for me how Mongolia has always thought about this and focused on this. And I think you, you will be a benchmark for other countries in this respect. Fourth and last, but not the least, you know, uh, we're all very good in the ODI or in the Mongolian authorities, government, and or in many countries are thinking about the strategy. We know what we need to do. We just need to do it. And implementation is, is yes. crucial. And we all know this is where every, you know, everything, when the rubber hits the road, as they say, that's what it really matters. So we need to implement, implement, implement. And uh, that's really important for Mongolia too. So let me thank our speakers uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank my colleagues at ODI for hosting us. And uh, finally, a, a warm thank you to all the participants, uh, over 50 of you who joined us today. I hope uh, that you continue these conversations uh, and that the, these, this today's event is frankly the start of more fruitful discussions on Mongolia's economic re recovery. Uh, we at ODI, Deputy Prime Minister and colleagues, we at ODI will remain engaged with Mongolia. I would personally love to be more closely engaged with you. Uh, I think the country deserves all our support. It is a beacon of both democratic and economic development. And I really thank, I wish you well in the future and what you're trying to do. Thank you all very, very much for attending. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you from ODI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.